Hello and welcome everyone to a special edition of the Poker Fuse podcast. I'm your host, Mike Gentili, along with my co-host, Nick Jones. And today we have a special conversation with Alex Scott, Managing Director of Poker for Microgame. Thanks for having me on, guys. Uh-oh. Glad Great to have you. you. Glad to have you. Um, just to give listeners a little bit of background on uh, who they're about to hear, uh, why don't you tell us a bit about your personal background? How, how did you get to become uh, such an important person for the microgaming uh, poker network? <laughs> Such an important person. You're, you're ridiculously kind. Uh, thank you for that. Um, so... I've I've been involved in poker for for quite a long time. I I got it got interested in it at an early age, and uh, when I left university, I sort of had made the assumption that I would move into the IT field in some way because that's what I studied. Um, but I developed this big passion for poker, and I was lucky enough to find a job uh, promoting the World Poker Tour to students uh, at my university and other universities in Edinburgh, um, and that was like my first foot in the door of the poker industry. And I've, I've basically worked my way up since then over the past 15 years or so. Um, I worked at PokerStars for four and a half years. Uh, I was at Full Tilt for 18 months during uh, some pretty interesting times as it, as it happens. Ah, okay. Uh, and then when I left Full Tilt, I, uh, I moved back to the Isle of Man and uh, was lucky enough to get a job with Microgaming a few months later. Um, so you I have PokerStars, Full Tilt, and MPN or Microgaming. That's right. Yeah. All right. So that gives us some perspective. Interesting times. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Tell us a bit. I, I saw that you had um, an article published on Card Player Lifestyle um, with Robbie Straczynski uh, that talked a bit about the differences in leadership style between Ray Batar and Isai Scheinberg, um, both uh, heads of. Uh, full tilt and poker stars respectively uh, tell us a bit about how it was working with those guys yeah so i'm i'm probably one of the few people in the world who's worked for both there's probably about i don't know i would say no more than 10 people who have worked directly for both this i and ray um which is why uh, robbie thought it would be an interesting article um to talk about the differences between them um, and how that might have impacted what happened uh, when Black Friday hit the uh, the poker market in 2011, I actually started a full tilt two months exactly two months before Black Friday happened. So uh, I had two months of good times, and then, uh, well, it was uh, very different thereafter. <laughs> so that was it was a very challenging time. Don't get me wrong, but it was also a really interesting time from uh, from the perspective of uh, yeah my sort of growth in this industry because it, you know I joined Full Tilt uh, to lead the design of their software. Um, and I ended up getting involved in all sorts of other things that I never would have had the opportunity to get involved in um, were it not for what happened. So, uh, but yeah, I remember I remember precisely where I was when, when Black Friday's news came out. And I remember precisely where I was when the license got revoked in June. Uh, I remember precisely where I was when uh, PokerStars bought the company. It was, uh, it was one of those things. Yeah, you know, like people remember where they were when 9-11 happened and so on. I remember those three days very vividly. Oh, just talking about um, uh, Full Tilt and its closure, and uh, it's a topic obviously we'll talk a bit uh, later about MPN and its uh, Prima platform. But are you surprised at all or were you surprised that uh, the Full Tilt software never returned to market in any form after obviously Black Friday and Full Tilt's closure? Uh, well, it, it did relaunch very briefly in 2012, um, and then eventually uh, PokerStars migrated uh, it, the players from the Full Tilt platform to the PokerStars platform, made some sort of cosmetic changes to PokerStars um, to, to make that more palatable for the players. I'm not really surprised, though. It just didn't really make sense for a company like PokerStars to maintain two uh, very, very different software platforms. And uh, PokerStars was the platform that had proven itself at scale, um, Full Tilt couldn't really achieve the same sort of player numbers that PokerStars had achieved, um, and therefore it was the logical choice. Um, I think also 
if, if you think about the egos involved for a minute, um, there's no way that PokerStars was ever going to allow Full Tilt to be the uh, the new software platform. It just wasn't going to happen. <laughs> yeah. Would you, do you think there's, um, you know, I think it, at the time it was always considered, you know, the best software out there for an online poker platform for a lot of different ways. Do you think today it's been surpassed either with NPN's offer or another operator? Do you still think Full Tilt perhaps has that, you know, holds that um, prize? I think the the full tilt of today is is Winamax and has been for some time. Um, Winamax has slowed down a little bit lately, so I mean you could make arguments for someone like uh, GG Network, for example, who's doing a lot of interesting things with their software to be you know the innovator of the times. But for many years it was Winamax. Um, I would say they almost immediately replaced Full Tilt as the uh, innovative leader. They did lots of interesting things with promos. They had a really nice polished poker client, uh, a really great mobile software and tablet software as well. And they brought things like Espresso to market, which everybody copied very quickly thereafter. Um, yeah, it's difficult to say, you know, I don't have a strong view necessarily on who's ahead at the moment, um, but for some time it was Winamax definitely. And if you think about who PokerStars was worried about, it was definitely them. So you've uh, you were at Full Tilt for a couple of months before Black Friday. There was a lot of stories that came out uh, around about that time. Uh, one uh, particular that sticks out to me is the uh, the lobster stories. Uh, were you around <laughs> to experience lobster for lunch at Full Tilt? Uh, yeah, actually. So there's there's two stories here which are are quite funny. I think. Um, so the first story is that uh, pre-Black Friday, Full Tilt had a reputation for ridiculously extravagant lunches at the staff canteen, like, you know, fillet steak topped with foie gras for lunch, that sort of stuff, wow. uh, in-house chefs preparing fine dining type food. And uh, after Black Friday happened, uh, there was obviously a need for the company to reduce its expenditure pretty significantly, actually. Um, and so... Uh, the food very quickly became lasagna and macaroni and cheese and that sort of thing. Uh, you know, the stuff that you can cook in big big batches. Um, now, that was designed to reduce the cost that the company was paying. Um, what actually happened um, is, uh, well, the office was in Dublin, Ireland, and uh, Irish people not really known. I'm, I'm sorry uh, to the entire country of Ireland for what I'm about to say, but... Uh, <laughs> Irish people not really known for their extravagant taste in food. And so what actually happened is there was a massive increase in the number of people taking up that lunch option and the, the cost uh, increased pretty substantially. So oh, they were paying more wow. for lasagna and macaroni and cheese than they were for fillet steak. Um, but anyway, that does lead me into the next story, which is um, one day stood in the lunch queue. I remember very vividly as we queued up for our gruel um, that uh, the chefs walked past with uh, silver cloches uh, for the uh, for the boardroom where uh, where Ray and the exec were uh, sort of entertaining some potential investors, and this is where the lobster thing comes from, right? So, for 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 a long time, the company was inviting investors into the office um, to try and to encourage them to invest significantly in Full Tilt so that it could relaunch uh, and be properly funded to do so and so on, and. Um, one morning, uh, they they had previously the night before they'd ordered in from some seafood restaurant, right? And so the following morning, we get into work, and in the kitchen there is like this pile of crab claws and uh, like discarded lobster and all sorts of stuff like that. Um, and that's where the lobster story uh, comes from. Okay, all right, all right. Uh, so, so it wasn't not, actually not quite as exciting served. as people might say. It wasn't actually served to the masses then. Uh, no, I don't think so. Um, okay. Yeah, by that point, the masses were getting uh, lasagna. So this was this was ordered in like an Uber Eats or something. Got it, got it, got it, got it, got it. Well, all right, well, tell us, uh, tell us about some of your work that you've done over at MPN, Alex. Um, MPN is, for those that may not know, is uh, scheduled to sunset, close down in 2020, um, and um, is still one of the remaining um, online poker networks which is a bit different per se than somebody uh, like Poker Stars, which, you know, runs for the most part a single brand. Uh, tell us a bit about what you did over at MPN. 
So I had a different, a variety of different roles over the years. Um, I came in to consult and game integrity for the company, um, and that was way back in 2013. And I ran a six-month project to review the company's current game integrity capability. And as a result of that, we made a number of changes. Like we um, we started a new in-house game integrity function, and uh, we built some new tools and and. Uh, refined processes and procedures and that kind of thing. And we actually built a game integrity function that I'm very proud of. Um, I, I think we are one of the safest places to play online poker at the moment. We have an exceptional team um, and our capabilities are, I mean, anecdotally, based on what I know about other providers out there, our capabilities are up there with the best. Um, so yeah, very proud of, of that. Um, once I'd completed that project, I got offered a full-time role here um, and uh, I, I've became head of poker shortly after that, um, so where I was ultimately responsible for the poker product here. Um, I then did a stint on the product side, so I was leading the the product teams, um, mostly software developers and project managers and, and so on, uh, for both poker and bingo for a couple of years. And then the company uh, sort of had a little restructure and uh, I was made MD of the poker division. and. Uh, a MD of bingo was brought in at that point. So I spent a fair amount of time here uh, responsible for the poker product or working with it in you know various capacities. Beyond game integrity, what would you say uh, has been something, one of your accomplishments or some of your accomplishments that you've had over at MPN that you're most proud of? I'm really proud of what we did with the MPN Poker Tour. Um, that was something that we started from scratch. Uh, our very first event had... Uh, I think 83 players and we sent one member of staff to run it had no guarantee um, and it, yeah it, w it was a very small start to something um, but we've we've grown it from that over the years and it's now uh, you know it's now attracting hundreds of players our final event will probably have you know best part of 500 players we'll probably have over 200,000 in the prize pool um, we've had uh, stints at the Battle of Malta, which is an incredibly successful event in Europe where we've been the, the lead sponsor and we've definitely made the most noise at the event and so on. Um, it, it, it has become you know, really highly thought of among the player community and I'm, I'm, I'm very proud of that and I'm proud of uh, the response that we've had uh, to that. Um, I'm also proud of what we achieved with the with the product towards the end. Um, what I'm hoping is, that, you know, we, we never got the chance to really finish and show what we had planned with that product. Um, but I I hope that the the latest release in particular sort of shows the direction that we're going. We were really really focused on the player, and you know how could we do new things to help the player experience how could we make the software more usable for uh, you know inexperienced players recreational players um yeah I'm, I'm i'm hoping that that people have seen the direction that we might have gone in had we not uh, made the decision to close just one question before we talk a bit more about premium i'm sure we, we've got a lot of questions there we'd like to explore but i'd be fascinated to get your take a bit more on the live poker tour and where you see it fits in with uh, an operator's overall strategy because we've seen some fascinating things happen. I think PokerStars has definitely consolidated, stepped back a bit on some of the, um, you know, the EPT type events that they did years back. Um, whereas we've seen Party Poker perhaps pretty aggressively expand what they do on the live scene. I just wondered what kind of MPN's goal goals were for running a live tour is this a conduit for online players to be able to experience live is it ever for bringing live players onto online and um, kind of where does it fit into an overall strategy for a for a network like mpn the truth is is a bit of everything right so um it's a great way to uh, build your brand and trust in your brand is one of the most important things that 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 exists when it comes to acquiring players if you have brand familiarity you have trust. If you have trust, you can sign up a player. Um, but we also know that um, uh, it, it goes the other way as well. So online players who engage with a, a live event are worth a lot more, uh, more than twice as much than the average player. So by providing a series of online events, uh, sorry, live events, you give those players an outlet um, and you can maximize the value of those players. So it, it goes both ways. We've seen a massive, massive increase in the 
uh, in the the live tournament scene, it's it's grown substantially over the past few years. And I think uh, if you look at the World Series of Poker, for example, uh, the stats are quite widely published on that. Um, there's been very, very clear substantial growth. And that's in the US market, which is obviously very challenging for lots of reasons. So uh, we definitely see the same thing in Europe, although in Europe it's much more fragmented. Um, so you've got this growth in a live market and you can use that to drive players online. You can also use it to maximize the value of the online players that you have. So it's 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 absolutely very valuable. And how do you see um, a, you know, a smaller operation uh, like micro gaming how do you carve out a niche in the on the live tour what do you do to you know get players to an mpn stop rather than you know perhaps a bigger um wpt poker stars party poker type event so at the time we launched we we sort of distinguished ourselves on a couple of factors the first one was at the time there wasn't really anybody offering uh events at that price point most events started around the 1000 euro mark or higher we went a little bit lower and um, this was before you know stars came along and did you know some really low priced events and so on um, and they they had sort of taken the focus off the uk ipt and events of a similar sort of buy-in at the time they'd raised the buy-in and um and placed less focus on them um we we went in with a different motivation to to most i think most people nowadays approach live events wanting to make a profit we just wanted to break even that was our first goal. And that was one of the reasons why we could operate at the 500 level. If we were going for a profit, the 500 level is a very difficult level to make uh, much profit from. Um, anyway, so that was one of the ways that we distinguished ourselves and that, that helped us to attract players, I think. It was the right price point for a lot of people. Um, and the second thing that we did is we focused on customer service. We wanted to make it a really special event um, where, which was, you know, easy for players in every respect and enjoyable for players in every respect. And uh, that means, look, it means simple things like, you know, if they show up at the hotel and they have an issue checking in, there's someone there to help them. Um, but it also means giving them things to do away from the felt as well. Um, you know, one of the things that we, we've made a big deal of at our events is, um, is putting on great player parties and putting on, uh, you know, tours of the cities that we visit um we've done go-karting we've done paintballing we've done bowling all sorts of things to bring the community of players that comes to the events together because you know if you bust out of uh of the event after a couple of hours um look you could sit in the casino and uh and and sit at the blackjack table or the roulette table but you know a lot of people don't want to do that they 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 came to madrid or they came to Tallinn or something uh, and they actually want the opportunity to go see the city, um, and we gave them that opportunity. Alex, what? Uh, so, getting back to the online product, uh, Prima, mm. what, what what was the driving force behind uh, releasing a new software platform? Mm. Obviously, there's you know updates and innovations that wanna uh, that operators want to incorporate into their new product to take advantage of. But what were some of the things that you were trying to achieve? with with prima the release of prima okay so i mean prior to the release of prima we had um if you go back far enough we had uh, six different uh, pieces of poker software we had uh, a couple of different pieces of poker software for mobile a couple of different browser-based platforms um we had one for download windows and one for download mac so we had a lot of uh, of fragmentation uh, in our platform, and that was one of the things that we were working to uh, to change over the years. Um, so Prima was the final step in that convergence of of software, um, which was very important to us when it came to being as efficient as possible with the the dev resources that we had. Um, but we were also, um, well, me especially, uh, was uncomfortable with the quality of the software that we were uh, releasing, in terms of its user friendliness. Uh, it, it, I felt it was over complex. I felt it got some of the little details wrong. This is one thing that Full Tilt was exceptional at and that Winamax is also very good at, is that it builds credibility because it gets the little details right. You know, when you're playing heads up, the button is in the right place. Uh, when you're playing a tournament, it uses uh, the, the rules that you would expect today in tournaments rather than the rules that might have been expected 15 years ago in tournaments. Those little details add up and they matter. And I was a bit uncomfortable with um, uh, the way that those things were handled in our own old software. 
Um, another issue that we had, though, was um, our old software was written in C++, and it was becoming very, very difficult to hire uh, capable C++ developers um, because it's it's a very old language. It's a very powerful language. Um, it, it can do a lot, and it's often the underlying language used when you need something to be exceptionally fast or exceptionally lightweight. Um, but it's also a very difficult language to use, and uh, particularly older versions of C++ are very difficult to use, and, and they make it easy for developers to make mistakes. Um, so most people these days are not taught C++. They're taught, taught C Sharp or Java. So if you want to hire people out of university and, and grow them to be good developers for you, you need to be working in C Sharp, really, or one of the more modern languages of the very least. So getting back to, to Prima and the online poker uh, software that you developed, uh, that was developed under your lead over at MPN, what would you say some of the, the highlights are of, of that particular upgrade? So it was, it was very player focused. And uh, if, you, if, if you look at some of the little details that we included in there, they come from my experience playing online poker over the years and they come from the team and the things that bugged them over the years. Uh, like, for example, um, it always used to bother me when I moved to a new computer and had trouble um, taking my notes with me uh, from, from one computer to another. So we made the notes store server-side. Um, we also uh, we introduced you know, new things to the tournament lobby, and we greatly simplified the tournament lobby as well. It's, the tournament lobby, by the way, is something that I don't think anyone does that well. Um, they're all too complicated. They all contain way more information than you actually need at the time. So we tried to simplify it, and we tried to focus on what information do you actually need at different stages in the tournament, and we tried to make it visually appealing as well so that you could you know, see at a glance um, the information that you needed. I think that, yeah, the thing that I'm proud of about Prima is that it was so player-focused. Now, it, it was focused on novice players and recreational players. It wasn't really ready yet for the, the, the more serious player. That was going to come with time. Um, uh, especially after we decommissioned our, our old poker software. Um, but obviously, with the closure of MPN, uh, that's now no, no longer going to happen. And is, is there any future for Prima? Is it going to end up anywhere, or is it just going to be put on the shelf and collect dust? Uh, well, look, we're, we're open to it. If there's someone out there that sees potential in it and wants to explore uh, working together, then I'm very much open to that discussion. Um, at the moment, there are no plans for it, though. Okay. So what, one one thing that I know was one of your goals when you launched Prima was to be able to do much faster iterative development, push out product updates. Zero downtime was one thing that you really strive for. And it definitely mm. seemed from, from my perspective that you managed to achieve that. I mean, in your nine months or a year that it's been live, you have... Um, you know, the, the platform has been upgraded substantially. I think you're on release 40 something. Um, but, you know, there's been a, a lot of iteration there. Would you say that that was, you know, a success for what you wanted to achieve? You were able to kind of execute on that? Yeah, certainly from a, from a development best practices uh, side of things, uh, we achieved a lot. Um, we, we didn't get quite as far as we wanted to. We, you know, we didn't have zero down, downtime yet. That was still some way to come. And we still had a lot of work to do on the platform side, the back end side. Um, but from the front end perspective, um, we were probably 75% of, uh, of the way there. Um, we were eventually going to be releasing much more often, um, probably every two to three weeks. That was the goal. That's what you see. If you look at the, the high performing dev companies out there, people like Spotify, Spotify releases every week now. And they release on a Friday, which is ballsy. You know, never release on a Friday because then you got to fix the bugs at the weekend. But they do, so they must have the you know their their stuff sorted. <laughs> you um, your team developed Prima, obviously or presumably, and correct me if I'm wrong, because you know you wanted to see metrics start going in a different direction. You wanted to see your your network grow in in player numbers. Um, is it fair to say that? You know, did you see those numbers move in the right direction, but it wasn't sufficient enough for the network to survive? Or um, was it, you know, you know, I don't want to put words in your mouth. Did, did you see the response that you hoped for from the software? Yeah, basically. Um, so Prima grew very quickly. And what we call the modern software, which is uh, Prima and our mobile client and our new instant play client, um, that, that was growing exceptionally quickly. 
Um, however, it wasn't growing fast enough to make up for the downturn we saw in the old software over the years. Um, and, you know, what, what I can say about my time at Microgaming is that while I was in charge, we lost less money. But that's, <laughs> uh, that's unfortunately, you know, the situation that it's in. Um, the product was a loss, uh, sorry, a loss leader for the company and was explicitly positioned as that. Um, it had never made money. Uh, not a not a significant amount of money anyway, um, and so, you know, one of the things I did um, during my time as managing director was an end to end strategic review of poker, um, and we found out lots and lots of interesting things from that, which uh, we can talk about, I suppose, if you want to. <laughs> oh well, yeah. I, I, so if it was explicitly positioned as a loss leader, then what was the driving factor behind closing it? Well, so microgaming have made a lot of assumptions about poker. Um, so, for example, one of the assumptions was uh, microgaming is a full service provider and we need to be able to provide uh, casino, sports, poker and bingo to our customers. If we don't, we're going to lose business from people out there who want all of those at the same time from the same provider. Now, that was probably true 15 years ago, um, but now it's absolutely not true. There is almost nobody out there who wants to take um, all of the different verticals from the same provider. It's just, it doesn't happen. What you want is you want to take the best product from the, the best provider, and that's never going to be uh, one company. It's always going to be a mixture of companies. Um, and so the the e-gaming business generally has shifted from this traditional model where everybody uh, took software from just one partner on an exclusive basis to a non-exclusive model where everybody has games from you know, 20 plus providers. They'll have poker software from from us. They'll have casino games from NetEnt. They'll have sports from SB Tech. Um, you know, there's there's not that uh, exclusivity and loyalty anymore. So that that turned out not to be true. And Microgaming had made other assumptions about poker as well, which turned out not to be true also. Um, so, for example, uh, another argument that was made to support poker was. Well, poker is always the first product to be regulated when you enter a regulated market. So it gives you first mover advantage. You can go in and you can build relationships with poker customers. And then when uh, sports and casino is regulated later, you've got those relationships in place. Now, that also turned out not to be true. Now, I believed this. I fully believed it until we did this review. Because I remember entering Italy um, when I was at PokerStars. And I remember entering France and Spain. And in all of those instances, I remembered poker being a first mover. Now, in reality, it wasn't. In uh, in Italy, sports was years before poker. And in France, sports came along at the same time as poker. Casino still isn't regulated in France, but sports and poker are. Uh, and in Spain, everything came along at the same time, if I remember correctly. Mm. Um, so what the truth is that... Um, Poker is one of the first products to be regulated, but sports has always been uh, at the same time or earlier. In almost all cases, I think Nevada is the exception. Um, but that turned out not to be true. And so the review basically, uh, <laughs> all of the, the things that, all, all, of, all of the reasoning that underpinned microgaming's operating poker as a lost leader um, turned out not to be true. Um, and... So all of a sudden we had to ask the big question, well, does it make sense to continue operating poker using this business model anymore? Uh, and the reality was, no, it doesn't make sense. Um, we should do something very different. And so we did consider um, a variety of other options, um, other things that we could do with poker, uh, one of which was to launch our own brand uh, and run as a B2C operator instead of B2B. Um, I would have loved to have done that, but unfortunately, uh, we we did that rule that out. It was uh, far far too expensive. <laughs> yeah, I could imagine uh, that would be least. quite an ambitious undertaking for sure. So, um, so here we are. I mean, we are doing something with poker, um, but it's it's something very very different to to what we're doing now. Um, it doesn't require anywhere near as many resources, and uh, uh, yeah, I can't really talk about it too much yet because we're not close enough to market. And but you'll hear more as, about it. Soon. Presumably, as part of that review, like you're looking at, you, know, you have uh, 16 skins on your network who will be um, 
many or most of them will be finding new homes. And presumably part of your review is that even if we you know, facilitate that move, you will still retain those customers for your you know, um, for your casino business. So even if they move over to, you know, Playtex iPoker network, um, you concluded that, that there wouldn't be the loss of custom there for the other more important verticals of micro gaming. Yeah, absolutely. And actually one of my big focuses at the moment is just making that migration as easy as possible for those customers. They will remain our casino customers and we have a very important relationship with every one of them. So, yeah, it's. I'm. I'm trying to make that migration as smooth and as simple as possible for them, so that uh, so they don't have to worry about poker. Well, we talked a bit about uh, some of the assumptions that had gone into offering poker. What What are some of the lessons that you learned after offering poker? Um, well, I think one of the interesting things we learned from the review. I mean, we challenged a lot of assumptions, not only our own. Um, and one of the assumptions about poker that's very, very commonplace in the market is that poker is in decline now. It is currently declining. Um, now, we, our, our review, we, we source data from all sorts of different places. We source data from uh, external consultants. We bought in data from Game Intel. Um, we used our own internal data. Uh, we used data from regulators. Uh, everything that we could get our hands on, really. Poker industry. Um, and what we actually... Yeah. Yeah, we did use Poker Industry Pro extensively, actually. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> Good to hear. A lot of screenshots of uh, of graphs from Poker Industry Pro in our report, actually. Okay. <laughs> um, so uh, I had a point. I'm sure I had a point. <laughs> Sorry so for the, the derail. The assumption was poker was in decline. Yes. So the assumption, um, which is very widespread in the industry, is that poker is in decline now. Um, what we actually found is there was a decline in poker from 2011 to 2012 after black friday happened absolutely there was a decline of course there was you know we lost the entire us market in that time there was a massive knock on effect full tilt ultimate bet oh sorry serious network um closed um so there was a major major decline at that time what's happened since then though is uh, is a bit different it's not as simple as saying it's just declined what has happened very, very clearly since then is that there has been a massive shift from cash game play or cash game activity to tournament activity. Um, and that's particularly been driven by um, Winamax's espresso concept and all of the copies of that. Um, so what what we saw in 2012 was that cash game uh, cash games represented about one third of revenue, just over, uh, sorry, two thirds of revenue, just over two thirds of revenue. Um, and what's happened uh, in the six, seven years since is that uh, it's completely flip-flopped. So tournaments are now in excess of two-thirds of revenue globally. Um, and if so if you know the proportion of revenue um, that, uh, that tournaments represent and cash games represent, uh, if you know the typical value of cash game players and tournament players, and if you know what the trend is in terms of number of active cash game players, which is the one thing that's tracked out there publicly and independently, then you can figure out um, what the total market size is, and that's what we've done. Um, and look, we made a number of different assumptions in this, and we had three different models, uh, you know, a most likely case, a positive case, and a negative case. Um, but what we found is that even in the negative case, Poker has only declined very slightly. In the other two cases, poker has either either um, stayed about level, stayed stable, or has actually grown. And you can particularly see the trend in growth from 2016 to 2018. Um, so what what's really happened is the players have stopped playing cash games and start playing tournaments. And you can definitely see this live and you can definitely see it online. Alex, can you share with us the, the breakdown of tournaments? So... Uh... You know how many, how much of that tournament activity is devoted to MTTs, to to spins, to sit and goes. Uh, no, unfortunately not. What we what we have is a, an aggregate, so we have everything other than cash games, basically. So ah, it is MTTs, okay. it is sit and goes, and uh, uh, espresso. Um, but yeah, I mean, we we know that a lot of it has been driven by espresso. So I've got loads of questions. It's a fascinating uh, uh, thing to discuss. Um, first question, in the, the, the reports that you did, how did you draw the boundaries of what you considered the market that you wanted to assess? I mean, did you look at all 
real money online poker play. So that includes what kind of I would consider basically untracked black market operations like the kind of private poker club stuff that we're seeing really surge in the Asian markets to networks like IDN, which really fly under a lot of people's radars, GG Network starting to be kind of more prevalent in Europe. But um, I think w w when we do these kind of assessments, we see maybe in the, you know, the established regulated markets, you might see some decline to maybe um, flatlining. But once you start adding in some of these uh, you know, less well understood markets, it changes the numbers pretty substantially. Yeah, yeah. so because we got our cash game data from Game Intel, um, which used to be called Poker Scout, we um, we stuck to the same markets um, for this analysis. Um, so we didn't include uh, sites like PP Poker mm. uh, or Pokio, which are a little bit newer and, uh, and and more private and a little bit, uh, you know, off off the uh, what's the word? You know what I mean? Yes. Yeah. Exactly the same uh, difficulty finding the right words to describe yeah uh, not on the same landscape perhaps yeah absolutely so actually if you were to include uh those uh, those types of site you know the private game sites and the, and the less regulated sites then the case for poker having grown is even stronger second question that i had just from what you were saying before when you're talking about yeah this this obvious migration over to tournaments in particular uh due to the growing kind of espresso uh spin and go type games how much would you say it is um, you know, a desire of players preferring this type of game. Maybe it's better for mobile play and better for casual play, less predatory and operators providing that product to, uh, you know, the flip side of that being the operators want to move people over to that game format. And thus by providing more tournaments, people are kind of not forcibly moving over to those games. But, uh, you know, if you put them more front and center, people are going to play those games more. How do you see that breakdown between like the players wishes and the operator's wishes ultimately in the preferred type of poker product I, I think both are aligned in this respect i think it's a little from column a and a little from column b mm -hmm. um so uh, definitely cash games have got harder uh, as in more challenging for players uh, much more quickly than tournaments have got more challenging for players um that's that i hold that view quite strongly um and uh, some of that is because of the effect of third-party software on cash games and the ability to um, to target the weakest players relatively easily and so on. Um, so because cash games have that kind of ecology uh, problem or, uh, you know, they have those ecology challenges with lo which lots of people have tried to address over the years, um, players have um, sort of naturally shifted their activity to tournaments because they have a better experience playing tournaments. And there's lots of other advantages to tournaments as well, particularly things like uh, Espresso. Very, very quick. You know how much you're in for. You know how much, uh, you know, it's relatively easy to control your level of uh, expenditure, that sort of thing. Um, and you can potentially win some very, very big prizes for a very small investment as well. So the, the marketing appeal um, of tournaments is very, very high. Um, but from an operator perspective, it does make sense to to move players from cash games to tournaments. If you know that people are having a bad experience in cash games and are likely to be worth more to you in the long term by moving them to tournaments, it absolutely makes sense to do that. Yeah. Well, one more question before we move on. Um, would love to get your take on briefly. Uh, we've seen one operator, Upstart uh, Online Poker Room, launch this year, run it once, that went cash game only initially presumably just due to it's easier to launch cash games first because, you know, tournaments kind of added complexity on top of that. If you were to start a new online poker room from scratch, you were put in charge of that, would you consider going like tournaments only? That's a really interesting question because I think I think what Rio has done is fascinating. I, I really like uh, Run It Once. I uh, have a lot of respect for what they're doing. Um, but they have made some, I mean, they were in a position like we were in with Prima in that they knew they couldn't do everything and they had to get, they had to get something to market and start making money relatively quickly. So they've made the decision not to, not to have tournaments. Um, so tournaments are two thirds of revenue. Uh, they've also made the decision not to have mobile. Um, and mobile is probably 80 to 90% of, of new signups. So they've really limited the addressable market for themselves by by choosing download only and choosing cash games. Um, now, they've probably made those decisions based on the established player base that they had because they had uh, run it once as an established brand 
um, op, you know, offering training to players and that kind of thing. So it may have made sense for them. But I think I think Run It Once is doing ab- absolutely brilliantly considering the the size of the market that it's targeting. I mean, bear in mind, it's also not in many regulated markets mm. either. So, I mean, it has access to a tiny fraction of online poker revenue right now, and yet it, it is surviving. And, uh, you know, we've seen in the last few weeks it's doing quite well with its new reward system and so on. Um, so I, I think there's a lot of upside um, if they're able to launch mobile next year, if they're able to add tournaments, um, particularly if they're able to add espresso style st- tournaments, um, I think they'll do very well. Building on the the run at once comparison, how how do you see other smaller operators being able to compete with the the big boys? So I actually I had this battle um, many times over the years with with some of our customers. Um, there was uh, there was one person in particular who wanted us to to copy features um, from Winamax and from PokerStars and and basically, you know, pick pick the best um, features and just copy them as quickly as possible so that we had all of the features that we would need. And, and my view is that um, we would just end up being a smaller PokerStars in that case. And why would you play on a smaller PokerStars? You know, play on the big one, play on the established one, play on the one yeah, that everyone else point. plays on. Why why play a smaller PokerStars? So I think that the the, the right strategy for a smaller site is to differentiate itself in some way. Um, so if you look at Unibet, for example, they've done that very well. Um, they've got a uh, you know, brilliant, uh, graf- uh, you know, very graphically appealing piece of software. Um, they've got some interesting US, well, uh, you know, the USBs are less strong now than they were a few years ago, but they, they do still have some USBs. Um, uh, Run It Once uh, has differentiated itself pretty well, I think. Um, they made some really in- interesting choices along the way, some very well-considered choices, I think. Um, and my view is that's the way to go. You know, We will see people start up um, smaller online poker sites that just have very complex software like Stars, and I, just, I don't think that's going to be successful for anyone, really. Mm. Okay. So we've seen trends in the industry, um, particularly uh, this year in 2019, that have started to maybe challenge the status quo um, with things like uh, operators' approaches to to hand histories, for example. Um, mm. What are some of your thoughts on how that's progressed? <clears throat> so hand histories uh, is probably one of our biggest mistakes at MPN. Um, and... So what, what we what we fail to recognize, I think, is that um, we have to live in the world as it actually is, rather than the world that we want. Um, and this is a lesson that I think everyone has to learn at some point in their lives, and we learned it too late at MPN. But we we were pretending that we lived in a world where everybody wanted to get rid of hand histories, and the reality is there are a lot of people out there who don't. You know, they're dependent on hand histories. They're dependent on third-party tracking software. And uh, if you take it away, they'll just go play somewhere else because not everyone is going to get rid of hand histories at the same time. So um, what we tried to make a compromise on MPN, and what we did is we, we changed our hand histories so that um, you'd only get a full hand history if you actually contributed to the pot. Um, and the idea was to take away um, some of the advantage that you can gain having third-party software where you're not really paying attention to what's happening at the table because you've been dealt out. Maybe you're paying attention to a different table or something like that. Um, we, we wanted to um, take away the ability to passively gather information on your opponents. You had to be actively participating. Um, and that was designed to reduce the power of third-party software and the advantage that it could potentially give people. Mm-hmm. What actually happened is when we made that change, uh, the third party software developer, and it is one one company mm. that makes both poker tracker and holder manager, they just said, Well, screw you guys, we're gonna we're gonna stop supporting you. Um so they dropped support for MPN in the next version and uh and you know we what we saw was a very slow decline, and this is why we didn't recognize it quickly enough, because um it was not an immediate pronounced decline like you might expect to see from a catastrophic change that you make. Um, and it also happened at the same time that we lost PKR as an operator on the network. So it was very difficult to uh, distinguish between the effects of each. Um, so it took us a long time um, to recognize the, uh, the the problem that we created for ourselves by getting rid of hand histories. Um, but I remember very clearly listening to um, 
to your podcast as uh, Party Poker were announcing their changes to hand histories and basically tearing my hair out, like thinking, what, what, what are these guys <laughs> thinking? I know exactly what's going to happen when they do this. Uh, I know what the next public report is going to say. They're going to blame a decline on uh, ecology changes, and that's exactly what happened. Um, and, it, you know, I found it a bit frustrating. I mean, why didn't they just look at what happened to us and learn from the mistakes that we made? Um, if there's anyone listening to this who's thinking about getting rid of hand histories, think again, seriously. <laughs> Interesting. So do you think the uh, it's the, the issue with the hand histories, is it truly the desire of the players or is it driven by the, the tracking software? Uh, so it's... It's it's a little bit of both, right? Because obviously the makers of tracking software have uh, um, uh, they've uh, a lot on the line. You know, they have uh, strong reasons to encourage players to use tracking software. And when Party got rid of their hand histories, we saw the maker of Poker Tracker and Holder Manager go out there with a a PR campaign saying that hand histories were a fundamental human right. Um, right. I might have exaggerated slightly there. <laughs> No, not at all. That's a headline uh, on Poker get, Views. Get and a, a quote from their uh, Max Verdi's um, head of PR. So, you know, you got that exactly right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Fundamental human rights. So, um, <laughs> I mean, <laughs> up there with like equal rights and, uh, you know, running water, that sort of thing. Anyway, uh, <laughs> yeah. I mean, they had a vested interest in, in hand histories being supported. And I guess we've seen Party Poker's move as. Uh, as very counterproductive for them. I mean, it certainly if PokerStars had followed, um, it would have been extremely damaging to their business. Um, so, but look, there's there, there are value in hand histories, right? So I one of the things I'm very, um, I'm actually very proud of in, in what we've done at Microgaming in the last couple of years is we've also focused um, on responsible gaming and we have focused on giving players tools that they can use to control uh, their poker play. Um, hand histories are, a very important part of that um you know it's as a poker player it's very important that you keep track of your results that you know when you're winning and losing and that you don't uh uh you know mislead yourself about whether you're a winner or a loser um, and hand histories are a very useful way of doing that and tracking software is a very useful way of doing that for me the line comes when you're you're using uh third-party software to gain an unfair advantage but I don't think it's an unfair advantage to track your own gameplay. I think that's a very valuable thing that all poker players should be doing. So and there's probably the, yeah, there's a line there, sorry, just to, yeah. to draw between you know hand histories and allowing HUDs. If I'm right in saying, correct me here if I'm wrong, that MPN stopped hand histories and you did uh, reinstate them after after a time and somewhat uh, anonymized, but you even today you don't allow any HUDs on the new Prima software. Is that correct? Um, they're not actually prohibited. It's just that nobody's chosen to support the new Prima software. It, it, it would have been pretty challenging to develop a HUD um, for our new software because of some of the pre uh, security features that it has built in. Um, but uh, it, it, we didn't prohibit it. Um, we, we didn't really want to prohibit something uh, that we couldn't properly police. And it is very difficult to properly police the use of HUDs. It's not impossible. Um, but I mean, at some point you've got to, you've got to think to yourself, is this where I want to spend my effort? Do I want to spend this much money and this much time, um, detecting HUDs when I could be investing that effort somewhere else? So, cause we've seen, I think party poker take the same path as again, maybe MPN's learning curve there, which is I think they banned hand histories outright. They have recently reinstated them, but still, yeah. I believe prohibit HUDs. And again, these hand histories come 24 hours after the fact. Do you think we're moving to a time? So, you know, you said, you know, if anyone's listening, there considering banning hand histories, you know, don't do it. It's a huge mistake. Would you say that still like trying to discourage the use of HUDs is still a direction that the industry should be moving in? So, you know, hand histories after the fact, look at your results, how you play fine. HUDs, however, is moving into a more kind of predatory area that operators should be discouraging. I mean, personally, yes, I do think that, and I think that the uh, where party and run at once have landed is 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 pretty good. Uh, I think that's that's a good compromise between giving players the ability to track their own game, um, and you know, discouraging some of the unethical play and some of the predatory behaviour that we see um, if you allow all third-party software. Um, personally, my my main objection to HUDs 
um, is, is just that it, they make the game so much less fun to play, so much less fun. You know, I remember when they first came out years ago, um, starting to use them and uh, starting to, to feel like th at some point there were going to be uh, a mandatory thing. If you wanted to be a, a winning poker player, you were going to have to use a HUD. And that made me very, very sad, you know. I felt like that really took something away from the game and made it less enjoyable. Uh, and I know I'm not the only one who feels sure. that way. Where do you see anonymous tables coming into this equation? Because I believe uh, MPM was one of the first with anonymous tables going back to like 2012 or something like that. Um, becoming more yeah. prevalent, we, all, we also believe PokerStars is going to have optional stealth tables in the next few months. Where do you see that fitting into this um, you know, landscape in terms of Games that are fun, obviously anonymous tables, one of the main goals is you can't use a HUD at these tables. Do you think that's um, you know, a large part in the in the future of the online poker industry? Um, to be honest, no, um, because I think um, we'll probably end up in a space where changes to hand histories and changes to software, uh, you know, is sort of eliminate make the need for anonymous tables they're, they're a, a useful stepping stone on the way though we learned a lot from having anonymous tables um uh, and we've published some of those uh some of those findings on our blog um you know one of the things that we that we notice for example is that um losers actually lose more um in anonymous games which i found very counterintuitive at the time um because they're there to protect losing players or you know that's part of the reason why they exist um, but they actually lose more, and that's uh, you know that's because good good poker players are still good poker players, even at anonymous tables. And um, actually, one thing that uh, the presence of HUDs does is um, it allows you to play more tables. But um, as you add more tables, your EV at each table decreases. Um, and so what we found is that um, because players without HUDs were concentrating on uh, fewer tables their win rate at those tables increased um, and therefore losing players who tend to only play one table anyway were actually losing more um, but that was very counterintuitive for me at first i did not expect that result um so i, I suspect that pokestars when they introduce their stealth tables will um will find something pretty similar um, and i'm interested to see which way they go um after they've introduced them whether they continue with ex those experiments or not so are we saying that hand histories and HUDs are good for recreational players? <laughs> no, I think the full the full picture of uh, of third party software um, is is negative for for recreational players and inexperienced players. Um, it's just that uh, when you compare an environment which is HUD rich versus an environment which is HUD free, you see these differences, um, and I think you can learn something from those differences. Um, you know, one one of the things we found, for example, is that we make more rake um, at anonymous tables, and that uh, you know the grinder players uh, pay uh, sorry pay more rake um, at uh, non-anonymous tables, but uh, we earn more rake per table um, at anonymous tables, and that's because there's way more action at anonymous tables than there is at non-anonymous. People are just much tighter when they're using a HUD. I think partially because they're playing more tables generally. Hmm. This is one, one, one of my concerns with anonymous tables, kind of just talks to what you're saying about games just being more fun. From my pers perspective, I find HUDs definitely reduces the enjoyment factor, but also anonymous tables do as well, because just being able to see the same faces at the games, particularly if you're playing a, a niche game. I used to play very niche games, and you'd see the same faces there every day. Yeah. And, uh, you know, a bit of a community feel. You build up your own reads in your head rather than with stats in your database. But this is perhaps my issue with fully anonymous sites is that you're losing an aspect that makes poker, you know, poker and why it attracts people to the tables other than, you know, the casino games or something. I, I, I'm concerned about eroding that kind of defining line. Um, it's the same way that I see with kind of certain forms of short format tournament you know i don't have a problem say with casino games in general but when the the there's a large gray area between one and the other you say you lose that distinction between the two yeah i i, I know what you mean i think and, and this is one of the reasons i actually like the approach that run at once has taken because it um it is anonymous but it doesn't feel anonymous 
And they've managed that in a way which is completely transparent as well. I mean, it's actually it's, it's exceptionally well done when you think about it. They've created the feel and the experience of playing an anon- anonymous game, but with all the benefits of an anonymous game when it comes to you know the removal of third-party software and predatory play and that kind of thing. It's very clever. Mm-hmm. So it, when we're talking about third-party tools, that leads me, I guess, to the, another um, big industry movement that we saw this year is uh, operators releasing information about bots. We've seen Party Poker do that. Um, we've seen uh, a U.S. <laughs> offshore-facing WPN uh, do that to some extent. Uh, how how big of a problem are bots in online poker? Um, I think they're overstated, if I'm honest. I think um, people believe they're a much bigger problem than they actually are. Uh, and I, this is really not helped by people like Morgan Stanley, who uh, yeah. I, I, I didn't even know that poker had a, a double A rating or whatever it is before Morgan Stanley released that report, <laughs> but they downgraded online poker um, based on uh, this idea that artificial intelligence was going to come along and uh, and destroy the game. Now, it's, it's not totally unfounded because um, if you think back, uh, I don't know, sort of 10 years, there was a time when backgammon was uh, was starting to become popular online and that was very quickly destroyed um, by artificial intelligence getting better and better and, uh, you know, it got to the point where you could run Snowy on, on a standard home computer and it could think three moves ahead and uh, anyone using it had a dominating advantage over everyone else. So backgammon quickly died out. Um, I'm, I'm amazed that a game like Rummy uh, is so popular um, throughout India, for example, because uh, Rummy is absolutely ripe for being destroyed by AI. If you know, if you've got a certain set of cards, you can uh, very easily write a computer program that can uh, show you the very best possible move. Same with Chinese poker. I mean, way back when I was at Full Tilt, people uh, in the dev team were writing solvers for Chinese poker in the in the spare time. Um, we love to play a bit of Chinese poker. They were just trying to get better, but uh, you know, if you were to unleash one of those playing Chinese poker online, you'd destroy everyone. You know, you'd make the best move every single time. Um, poker, though, the poker that we know and love is so much more complicated. And uh, there are so many more uh, possible scenarios and, and things that may happen that um, I don't see AI being uh, as big a threat as some, some do. Now, this is not to say that AI won't get very, very good at playing poker. It's just that actually applying a very, very good AI um, to online poker and using it to win money consistently against the public is a very different story than building the AI in the first place. It's a totally different set of skills, um, and it's an arms race between us as online poker operators and people trying to use bots. Now, bots have become sophisticated, more sophisticated over the years, but so have our detection abilities. And, uh, you know, while there have definitely been times when uh, bots have taken a leap ahead and have had uh, had it a bit easier for a few months or whatever, there's, there's also been times when we've caught up and then we just catch them again. So it, I, I do think that um, AI will get exceptionally good at playing poker, um, particularly simpler forms of poker, like short stacked, limit hold them, uh, you know, heads up, that sort of thing. Um, but the more complex forms of, uh, of poker will take some time. Um, I, I, I just don't see that being successfully applied to online poker in a big way, in, you know, in a damaging way for, uh, you know, probably 10, 20 years. So you don't see the current state of bots being a, a, a big threat for operators uh, at their current level of expertise? Um, it, it depends on who you're talking about, because if you look at the industry, some people are a lot better than this than, than others. And generally, I think players have it roughly correct. I mean, PokerStars is definitely the safest place to play um, when it comes to artificial intelligence and, and uh, game integrity generally. They have been for some time. Um, there are a few other people who are taking it seriously. Um, MPN is definitely one of them. We've taken it very seriously for a long time now. Um, Party is starting to take it seriously, which is great. Um, and then we have a number of others who are, are sort of making noise about taking it seriously. Um, I think some of them do, some of them don't. I know that Unibet has poached a few people from our game integrity team, so they probably are taking it seriously. <laughs> <You know? laughs> um, uh, yeah, pe- so it, it depends on who you're talking about. If, if, you, if I was a bot maker right now, I know where I would go. <laughs> okay. um, and I know where I wouldn't go. And generally, you can go on 
you know, forums for bot users and you can see where they tell you not to play and they tell you not to play at PokerStars and they tell you not to play at MPN. Okay. What, uh, how, how do you see the industry moving forward from here um, without MPN, obviously, but uh, just in terms of trends, uh, for example, the network model, MPN uh, operated on a network model where they had different skins, uh, different companies would come together and MPN would offer the, the platform to play on. Um, we've seen that kind of uh, diminish over over the years, do you think that there's a future for the network model going forward? Well, so I think it's just just to begin with, I think it's important to distinguish between the business, the business model, and the network model. Um, they they both have their challenges. Um, B two B has some some major challenges in that um, what customers expect of you is is getting. Uh, uh, you know more well it's getting huger and huger every day the expectations are increasing every single day and yet the amount that they're willing to pay you is getting smaller and smaller every day um so you know we found ourselves in a position where our costs were were increasing um quickly um but our revenues weren't um and that's that's very very challenging and i think that other people in the b2b space um will have the exact same challenges that we had um, the network model has has all sorts of different challenges. I, I do think the network model can succeed in certain circumstances. Um, one of the issues that we had over the years with the network model is that many of our customers competed against each other. Um, so, for example, uh, you know, Betson Group competes against uh, Gaming Innovation Group. So, they're BetSafe, but Betson's BetSafe brand and Gigs Guts brand. They're direct competitors with each other. They're in all the same markets, and they they should be tooth and nail fighting it out but we're asking them to come together and cooperate and actually not market to the same players ideally because we want to attract new players to the network and we don't want to just move them around from one skin to another um, so that that makes things very challenging when you're doing that a network model however that i think can work is when you have um, operators who are not going after the same players so if you had for example you know, some utopian world where all the countries share online poker liquidity and you could have an operator in Italy, an operator in Spain, one in the UK, uh, one in France, uh, you know, perhaps one in uh, Nevada, one in New Jersey, you know, not feasible yeah. at the moment, maybe one day. Um, then that's the kind of poker network that can succeed because you don't have people fighting each other for the same players. They're incentivized to cooperate. And that's what a poker network really, really needs. Um I think poker networks where people directly compete with each other will continue to have uh, some very difficult challenges over the years. It doesn't mean that they can't work. Um, the ones that are working right now, though, they're in uh, some very risky markets. Um, if we look at uh, the, the poker networks that are number one and number three right now, they're predominantly Asia-facing, and that is a, a, a very risky market indeed. Um, and it's not somewhere where I would uh, uh, particularly like to be uh, on the police's wanted list. Put it that way. Okay. <laughs> uh, what other what other trends do you see as uh, that the future might hold for online poker? So one of the trends which definitely stands out to me is the increase in private games. Now this is happening both online and live. Um, so we're seeing live, we're seeing, uh, games being built around, uh, you know, business people, um, uh, celebrities, that sort of thing, uh, invitational games where people who are fun to play with, uh, are invited and people who will sit there with their headphones on the whole time and not saying a word are not invited. So at the highest stakes of poker now, you have to have great social skills if you want to succeed. And that wasn't always the case. It was the case in the old days. But we went through a period where it wasn't the case. Um, and it seems like we're regressing back to that uh, private game model in High Stakes Live. Now, uh, if you look at Triton, for example, you know, you have business people who invite professional poker players. Uh, and that's a very, very interesting, uh, uh, you know, series to watch. It reminds me of the old uh, Onyx Cup idea that Full Tilt had, <laughs> uh, you know, exceptionally yeah. high stakes tournaments. Um, and then online, we've got the same sort of thing happening now. Um, PP Poker is the biggest example of this, um, you know, where they use the play money model and the uh, agent system. Um, 
which uh, oh god, we could have entire podcast episodes about those if you want. <laughs> uh, there's so much to talk about there, um, but I mean they are growing exceptionally quickly, and um, <clears throat> it's a very interesting business model. Do you um, think, Alex, that said, those are? Excuse me. Yeah. Do you think those are growing because of uh, regulatory restrictions, or just because of the popularity of the the format? It's a bit of both because we know that they're popular in markets even where there aren't any significant regulatory restrictions. Um, for example, Norway. Um, now, Norway does have regulatory restrictions, but not that many, really. I mean, most people operate in Norway relatively simply. Um, but yet the private game market in Norway is is huge and it's getting, it's getting bigger all the time. Um, and it's... It, <laughs> I think it's a, a, a maybe a cultural thing or a psychological thing. People prefer to play poker against people they know. Mm. Um, they they always have really. Um, and you know, we were talking just now about uh, about anonymous tables and uh, about how um, the experience isn't as fun in anonymous games, perhaps because uh, you know you don't know who you're up against and you're not playing the same faces all the time and that kind of thing. Uh, in the private games, it's the opposite. You know, you know who you're up against and uh, perhaps you know them in real life um, perhaps it's your poker club that you go to a couple of nights a week that has organized this um, you know this PP poker club or whatever for you to play when you're not in the in the venue that kind of thing so um, well I do think regulatory, regulatory restrictions play a part particularly in places like China Brazil um, the US and so on um, uh, I think it's also a psychological thing, and I think that um, a lot of people, even in places where you you can freely play online poker, still prefer the private game model. Looking forward uh, to the future of rewards, for example, and promotions, um, we we see a lot of uh, operators trying to distinguish themselves in that area. Uh, perhaps uh, we've even seen some innovative ideas. I, I would look to the uh, poker stars and what they're doing with the PSPC as uh, uh, that type of innovation. How do you see um, rewards, rake back, and, and promotions in general uh, going forward in the industry? Um, I think this is a really interesting area. Um, and what I think th there's two things, two trends that I can. Uh, I can sort of pick out, if you like, over what's happened over the last couple of years and what I would expect to continue. So the first is randomization, um, which is, in other words, rewards that are not directly linked to the amount of rake that you generated in a game. So we've seen that with uh, PokerStars Chests. Um, we've also seen it with uh, Run It Once's Splash the Pot. Um, and there are, you know, various advantages to to that model. Um, you know, it, it doesn't incentivize the same sort of behavior that paying direct rate back uh, incentivizes. Um, and it can be a really positive experience for recreational or, you know, new players. Um, so I think we'll see more of that uh, in the future, more more of a randomization element in rewards and in poker in general. I mean, we've seen it, seen how successful Espresso has been over the years. I think we can expect to see other new types of uh, products along those lines. Um, the other thing I think we'll expect to see is personalization. Um, now, there are regulatory uh, considerations to this because um, if you personalize too much, um, it can appear uh, like you, you, you're taking advantage of, a, of, a, of an individual. Um, and there was a lot of talk about this at a recent conference that I attended about um, you know what level of personalization is actually appropriate. Um, and there are lots of stories in the press about, um, you know, VIP gamblers who are, you know, phoned up by their VIP, VIP manager and offered personalized experiences and things like that, um, which have been very badly received. But I, I do expect to see personalization um, be a, a major feature of reward systems in the future. And I don't think um, that we'll, we'll have reward systems that just pay the same to everyone. So, I always uh, um, find yeah. it fascinating. Um, just touching on that kind of randomization nature. So if we go back 10 years or so, it seemed like every online poker room had a bad beat jackpot. And I think I think NPM had one back in the day. Uh, and everyone mm. shifted away from that entirely. Um, and the reasons given were, you know, you 
um, are putting a lot of money into one person's pocket, which is just going to be like withdrawn and taken out of the tables. It's that random nature that nobody really likes. And now we're seeing like it's it's almost come back to the point that, you know, MPN's uh, lottery sit and go type game has got a progressive jackpot in it. Um, yeah. You know, is there now like could we go back to a place where an operator might have great success reintroducing a bad beat jackpot at the cash game tables? Yeah, I mean, for what it's worth, we still have a bad beat jackpot. It's just not like the traditional uh, bad beat jackpots of of old. Um, ours is it wasn't yet introduced into our Prima client, which is why it's not that well known about. But uh, it is there in the uh, the classic client. Um, we we had addressed that issue a little bit differently. We um, award the bad beat jackpot to anybody who's playing at the same stakes that the jackpot is hit, um, as well as people playing at the table and people who are involved in the hand that, that, that causes the bad beat jackpot to be hit. So it's distributed among a much larger number of players, um, which takes away the, um, the argument that, you know, you, you pay a million to a player and he just cashes it out. So it's not worth it. Um, but yeah, I, 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 I think, I'm very proud of uh, our fish party progressive jackpot, by the way. <laughs> it's one of one of my few successes, I guess, over the years. I, I'm amazed that nobody has copied it um, because I think it's such a good idea. Maybe I'm wrong. I don't know. Um, but yeah, I, I do think we'll see uh, more big jackpots like that, but perhaps not. I, I don't I don't see a widespread adoption of the really huge jackpots like we saw. I think it was towards the end of last year. We had uh, stars and party just it seemed like a back and forth fight over who could have the largest uh, spin jackpot. Uh, they went from 1 million to 2 million to 3 million and so on. I, I just, I don't see that really taking off long term um, because the downside to the operator is just too, too large. It's, and there's not that much difference between say, you know, 500,000 and uh, 3 million when it comes to attracting players. They're both massive, massive numbers that you can't really, you know, wrap your head around. So given your, extensive history in the industry and your experience working with both full tilt MPN uh, and poker stars and also MPN, you had to have accumulated some interesting stories in your time, Alex. Uh, <laughs> any come to mind that you'd care to share? Um, I've, I've got two, two interesting ones. Uh, I think so the first one I, I remember very, uh, very vividly having a conversation with Isai about Tom Dwan. Um, it was back when uh, he was he was coming to uh, uh, sort of coming to the fore. He was he was quite well known, and um, uh, both Poker Stars and Full Tilt were uh, trying to make him an offer to be a sponsored pro. Um, and he wanted a ridiculous amount of money, something like a hundred thousand dollars a month. Um, and uh, I was having a conversation with this guy about whether he was worth it or not, and I said absolutely not. Absolutely not. Do not pay this guy. Don't pay him anything. Like, I was the biggest <laughs> anti dwan you could imagine. I just thought, like, he, he's, he's not a guy that, um, that people should be looking to emulate. I didn't see him as an aspirational character at all. Um, uh, and uh, how, how wrong was I? <laughs> uh, full, full Tilt went on to, uh, to sign him for a ridiculous amount of money, and he was incredibly successful. And... Uh, and people looked up to him to, for many, many years until he disappeared into Asia somewhere. Um, and what did was, he uh, say to you after a period yeah, of time he, that he, had he thought, thought I was wrong for what it was worth? <laughs> ah, from the beginning. <laughs> he, he, thought, he thought Tom yeah. Dwan was absolutely worth it. Um, another fun one, which I don't know if it's a rumor or if it's actually true, um, but also involves a sponsored pro. Um, so uh, for a while, PokerStars was sponsoring Barry Greenstein. And, um, you know, Barry would get paid into his PokerStars account. Um, and Barry Greenstein's uh, online nickname at the time was Barry G1, right? Now, uh, at some point after, uh, after months of him being a sponsored pro, he approached somebody in the company and said, oh, hey, I've not been paid. Um, you know, can you look into it, please? And they looked into it and... Uh, found that they had been paying his salary to uh, Barry G. Not Instead Barry G. Barry one. <laughs> and paying his salary to Barry G for many, many months. And Barry G had just been quietly logging on every month and cashing out this check wow. Uh, wow. and enjoying the proceeds. Just some random guy called Barry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh wow! Yeah. Uh, yeah, I don't know if that one's actually true, but it was certainly uh, yeah, certainly passed around a lot in the in the old days. That, um, but yeah, that was. I mean, back then, just the, the kind of controls that exist today. Um, 
didn't really exist. It, it's feasible that that might have happened. Um, yeah, Barry G, if you're out there, <laughs> <Fun. Yeah. laughs> congrats to you. Alex, any crazy post Black Friday stories coming out of the full tilt offices that you'd care to reflect back on? Do you know what? Not too, not too many, really. I mean, uh, post Black Friday we, uh, was a very challenging time for obvious reasons. You know, it got to the point towards the end where all of the niceties about the office were were gone. They'd been stripped back. I mean, we didn't even have tea and coffee in the office anymore. So actually, me and my wife, who had, uh, you know, she had moved to work after Black Friday for full tilt. Amazingly. Um, we used to go to Tesco a couple of times a week with uh, the spare change that we collected from the office and just go buy milk and tea and coffee and stuff like that for everyone. Um, the few people that were left. Now, a few interesting things happened, I suppose. Um, you know, with the, the sort of weird freedom that we had, we we developed some weird things in the, in the Full Tilt software. Like um, uh, there was a guy who developed, I think, 15 new games uh, in the Full Tilt software, um, a few of which were released after relaunch. Um, five card stud was, I think the first one because it was so simple. Um, but he yeah. developed games like Corchevel and, uh, six card Omaha and, uh, oh, what else? Um, pineapple that guys working for poker stars now. <laughs> yeah, he is actually, as it happens. <laughs> I was yeah. joking. <laughs> no, he is. Um, yeah, he, I mean, he, yeah, just basically on his own, maybe with the help from a couple of other people, he developed loads of new games for the full tilt software. And we had like internal tournaments where we would play each other, uh, hmm. which was a lot of fun. The, the, the home games at full tilt were, were loads and loads of fun. Uh, and some exceptionally great players um, uh, played in those games. Uh, a guy called Max Silva is now, uh, uh, he now has a WSOP bracelet. Um, you know, he's yeah. uh, an excellent poker player. Uh, and I learned a lot from playing against him. Um, definitely didn't rise to the stratospheric levels that he did, but, uh, but Hey, um, yeah, the Pokestars home games were definitely not as tough. I used to do really well in those. <laughs> <laughs> did you have the opportunity to play with Isai in any of the home games? Uh, no, I didn't know. He, he wasn't that sociable, um, as it happens, but I do know that, um, he played when, when the company organized the tournament on the Isle of Man a few years later, a few years after I left, um, he did play in in the UK IPT High Roller and won it. Yeah, I saw the picture on Robbie's blog with him with the the spade. Yeah. 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 So I mean, I oh, I did play with him once actually. I played with him once at a at a uh, like a social event which had been organised at the casino, and he took it very seriously. Um, you know, he was definitely a poker player through and through. Uh, he really cared about the game, um, and you know was. He was quite tight from what I remember, but he was a, a pretty solid player. Would you invite him to your private poker game? Uh, well, he definitely wouldn't accept. <laughs> 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 so sure, why not? <laughs> all right. Um, I think we've covered just about all the topics that uh, we had in mind. Is there anything else that you'd like to share, Alex, before we sign off? Uh, not really. Um, thank you so much for inviting me on. I've been a, a big Pokerfuse fan for uh, for many years. I've read the uh, uh, I've read the website, the news uh, uh, for many years, and I've enjoyed the podcast since you've uh, released it. So I'm really honoured to be invited on. Thank you. Great. Well, it was uh, fantastic having you for sure. Well, thank you very much for uh, for that. That was fascinating. Really, really interesting. <laughs> Well, that wraps up this episode of the Poker Fuse podcast. As a reminder, please give us a like and a subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. And you can also follow us and interact with us on Twitter. Nick is at PokerProJones. I'm at SpookyBugs. Thanks, everyone, for tuning in. Mm-hmm.